This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Can Brian Johnson live forever? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason. My co-host is Liz Wolf, associate editor at Reason. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. Sitting between us uh, will be a man who wants to do the impossible, not die. There is no more audacious goal, depending on who you ask, the prospect of using technology to radically increase lifespan is either an act of unbelievable hubris destined for a flame out of mythical proportions not seen since Icarus, or a heroic venture that will push humanity to finally conquer nature's final boss, death itself. Brian Johnson made his fortune when he sold his company Braintree to PayPal for $800 million, netting about $300 million for himself, and he's plowed about $2 million a year into creating a system to reverse his metabolic biological age. He's 46 chronologically, but claims he's de-aged himself biologically following a program he's branded The Blueprint. Brian Johnson, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. And my first question for you is, it's a little bit past noon Pacific time right now. What did you do today? I woke up at 4.30 and I did a few things. So I'll give you the specifics. I walked into my bathroom and I did some UV exposure, 10,000 lux light into my eyes for two to three minutes. I measured my internal body temperature uh, with uh, through my ear. I weighed myself looking at weight, fat, uh, hydration. I did HRV therapy on my left ear. I did some meditation. I went downstairs. I consumed about 20 pills and drank a concoction of uh, various nutrients and minerals. I then worked out for an hour including VO2 max training, which is trying to boost my cardiovascular capacity. I then got ready for the day and I began working. What is the, te you're blasting 10,000 lux into your eyes. What does that do? It uh, stabilizes my circadian rhythm. So I wake up before the sun rises. Right. And so it's there to tell my body we are awake. The day has started, start the clock so that you can be on time and be ready to go to bed at 8.30. I, I logged what is potentially the best sleep score in human history. I achieved 100% sleep quality for eight straight months. And mm -hmm. I wanted to demonstrate that humans can in fact achieve predictable high quality sleep for eight months in a row. And so I do these things because it, it has been uh, helpful in me achieving these sleep scores. Hmm. Wow. The vast majority of people don't have high quality sleep at all. What are the implications of that? I mean, why do you prioritize this to the, to the degree that you do? When someone is sleep deprived, they are essentially inebriated. It's the same hmm. as being drunk. Huh. I know personally, I feel grumpy. I feel cloudy. I'm irritable. Uh, I'm I'm half or a quarter of a human as I otherwise would be when I'm rested. I know mm -hmm. that I, I've tested this. I mean, even in the past week we did a, uh, I, I did a health rave in, in New York. This is a like phase two of, of blueprint. And I went to bed at 2 AM and the next day, uh, was a wonderful reminder of what it feels like to not get 100% sleep. Hmm. What, you know, you design your day, uh, to, to the minute almost, it seems so like, what is the purpose of doing this? The early bird, you know, you're getting up at 4 30 AM and I don't know when That's you're calling not it. That's early, it's Zach. I wake up at like 5 AM every single day. If okay. Not well, early. you can bond over your, uh, yeah, you're, 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 you, uh, Brian and Benjamin Franklin are all early risers. <laughs> so you're in good company, but yeah, to give us the, like, wh what's your uh, reasoning for waking up so early by most people's standards? Uh, I tested it. So I use my, use, my answers typically have data behind them. So for mm -hmm. a couple of years, I tried to hone in my algorithm on how would you achieve a 100% sleep score every single night. And within sleep, there are a few metrics that you can determine someone's biological age. So for example, 
uh, wake after sleep onset, which is called WASO, is an a is a marker for age. And so the older you get, the more time you spend up at night. So you go to sleep and you wake up, and sometimes people will be up one, two, three, maybe even four hours a night, or even just get up, and that's that, that's an, uh, all the sleep they'll get. And so having a WASO less than thirty minutes is my target. So once you go to sleep, mm. you want to stay asleep. And if you do wake up, you want to be able to go back to sleep as one example of a marker. And so there are characteristics within sleep of what is ideal sleep. And these, of course, are representations of how your body is functioning. And so if you're sleeping very poorly, you've got some kind of issue somewhere. And so we've tried to basically iron these out. And this, all these things uh, probably don't make sense to people, and they probably understand them to be erratic. And, you know, eccentric and weird and all sorts of things like that, unless you understand the context, which is I set out to pose this question, could I build an algorithm that takes better care of me than I can myself? Mm -hmm. And the observation was that technology has done that in several areas. Mm -hmm. Technology, for example, is better at flying airplanes than we humans can. It is better at, um, you know, navigating us on the road. It is better at uh, doing certain kind of language processing. And so when algorithms achieve a certain point that they achieve human ability, we adopt those algorithms and we now we allow them to do them in our lives. And I was posing the question of something that we consider to be quite sacred, which is you know, a person's decisions about what they eat and when they go to bed is something that we typically have said that's the human domain of free will and preference that, you know, I'll choose when I want to go to bed based upon these considerations, including whether my favorite show just dropped or whether I'm doing this or that. And I wanted to pose the question in this technological age we're in, can an algorithm paired with science, in fact, take better care of me than I can myself? And so that's what the result of this entire protocol is, is that probing that question. Well, I think on one hand, this type of thing does sound eccentric, but on the other hand, if you flip the burden of proof for a moment and consider what we you know, deemed to be the norm in, you know, America in 2024, that actually seems awfully um, bizarre. The fact that it is seen as sort of standard to essentially poison your body with sugar, to be mm. overnourished by getting far too many calories, to have, you know, very sedentary lifestyles, and then to be, you know, completely dropping the ball on sleep and sleep quality, right? Like on one you, hand- You mean on like an evolutionary time scale? this is Yeah, the outlier, exactly. Right? We are the outlier. We are the, like what is seen as like the standard American diet and the standard American way of living and in much of the world too, right? Like Mexico is no better than we are. Um, you know, tons of, tons of countries are no better than we are. But like, it's odd that Brian's routine would be seen as the eccentric outlier when in reality- what we are currently doing on mass, what we consider to be standard and normal is highly disturbing. Liz, I've done a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. You are the first person to say that. Really? Mm -hmm. That's surprising to me. I mean, I, uh, I agree with you. I think that norms are insane. Yeah. Hmm. Liz is ready to get on the blueprint. It sounds like <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, so I, I read through some of your book. This is reminding me of a, a, a passage from your book, which is called Don't Die. <laughs> and uh, the passage that I have highlighted here, uh, you say we're about to ex experience an evolutionary transition on a scale rarely seen, a transition whose closest approximation is the changes written by evolution from early hominids two million years ago all the way to humanity today. What is that evolutionary transition you're alluding to and what is driving it? We now have the ability to engineer existence, including atoms and molecules and organisms biological systems, our digital reality, computers, we have the ability to engineer almost every layer of existence from the physical world to our digital world. Now we haven't yet uh, gotten our ability to do things like complex systems like the weather. We don't have the ability to control that yet. So we're working our way up the stack in terms of the complexity we can tackle and the body is still not entirely known. We're still trying to figure our way out, but we have the basic admin access, we have root level access to the controls of reality. 
And when you have that and you have on the flip side, intelligence that is in improving at speeds that are, un, are incomprehensible to us, you have the making of a rewrite of existence. And so to put this into slightly technical terms, Homo sapiens for the past 200,000 years have been a, a first principles thinking species. So we acquire knowledge. We are the stewards of knowledge. We individually and we collectively own knowledge. We do so in books. We do so in our brains. We do so in, in conversation. And AI is going to become the steward of knowledge. It will be better at acquiring knowledge and generating new knowledge than we can. It will do so at a speed that won't allow anyone to keep up with the pace of it. So we humans are transitioning from a first principle species to a zeroth principle species. And zeroth principle means it's the unknown unknown. So for example, a zeroth principle discovery is Einstein's discovery of special theory of relativity. You can't get there through Newtonian physics. You pull it from another dimension. And so we as a species are going from knowing things to not knowing things. And so that's mm -hmm. why it's the biggest transformation in the history of our species it fundamentally turns on its head the primary thing that has allowed our intelligence to thrive. So will we, when you say that we're, you're going to, you're already following a sort of algorithm that yeah. you've put together, but is what you're imagining an mm -hmm. algorithm that we don't even fully understand. We just know that it works. So this is what you should follow if you want to live to be 500 years old or something like that. Exactly. You can think of the parallel like the stock market. And so right now we are in the early days of our bodies. We say, eat this kind of food, take this kind of supplement, you know, just do this mm -hmm. kind of exercise and sleep this much. As we mature in the technology internally, we'll have technology treating our body like a stock market. It will be doing real time transactions on genes and proteins and this biological process. And it will be doing these things at a speed that are incomprehensible to us. We won't know exactly what's happening. You're just applying AI to it. At that point, it exceeds our ability. We cannot control things at the, geno at the genetic level. We have other instruments to do that. And so, yes, it's mm -hmm. going to basically surpass our level of abstraction and reach. And that's, it's happening right now. It will just be much more robust. And so what Blueprint is, is an analog version of an algorithm running me with the tools we have today, but fast forward in some duration of time, mm -hmm. and it's a high speed transaction engine, everybody's will be, and it's maintaining a pristine state at all times. Wow. So you're trying to bootstrap this uh, kind of <laughs> advanced uh, in intelligence that, uh, you know, it's unclear what the exact relationship to humanity will be and like what it what it will mean to be human in, in that world. Um, but I, I want to let's let before we uh, kind of ruminate on that a little bit more, let's look at the mechanics of what you are doing right now and what you call the analog version uh, with with your blueprint. Um, you mentioned at the top there that you took about 20 pills this morning. Um, here's a slide from your blueprint, your supplement stack, which shows a list of all the different uh, supplements that you're taking. Some of them seem to be a bunch of supplements combined into a singular pill. So if you didn't have that, it would be even, even more pills mm -hmm. that you would be downing. Um, I, I'm not going to ask you to go through every supplement you're taking, but uh, could you talk a little bit about the process of this? Like, how did you reach this kind of final number on your blueprint? Or, or maybe it's not so final a number. Yeah. The unique thing we did is I imagined the question, if Magellan were alive today, or Lewis and Clark, or Ernest Shackleton, or Armstrong, or Amelia Earhart, and you're contemplating what is the most epic adventure we can do in this moment. Uh, my observation was, let's see where we're at with the fountain of youth, this hmm. story that's been around since the beginning of intelligence. And so what we did is we combed through all of the scientific literature on health span and lifespan. We then ranked all the studies according to effect size, the, the best ones, and then we graded the evidence. And then we found the power laws. We said, what if you apply all the power laws of all the science into one person? What happens? And we did that with me, and I became the most measured person in human history. And then we said, here's the data. And so here's the process, here's data, and we shared the entire thing for free 
with the entire world. And that's what we've done over the past three years. And it's pretty persuasive. I mean, the outcome is that you can meaningfully change your speed of aging and even change the age of certain parts of the body by doing this process. We're not there yet. Like we can't arrest aging and there's still some limitations, but still the conclusion is uh, we're a pretty good spot to start this. Why do you, I mean, do you why do you want yeah, to live ahead, forever? Look. Like what, why do you like it so much? Yeah. Living like forever, so much? <laughs> <laughs> living for, forever breaks the human brain. Uh, our brains cannot compute the concept of forever. Mm -hmm. The concept we can understand is living tomorrow. And those two ideas are basically the same. There's no difference. And so you probably have things you want to do tomorrow. I do too. And when tomorrow arrives, I'm imagining I'm going to have things the next day I'm going to want to do. And so it's really the framework I use. I don't say I want to live forever. I say I want mm -hmm. to live tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Is there, you know, but you are putting out, you know, books called Don't Die um, and uh, at least like floating this idea that we could have r radically longer lifespans. Um, is there anything that makes you believe like, you know, you're, you're taking all these supplements uh, that that's the sort of first step and also diet, which we'll get into and, and sleep. But um, my understanding for like longevity is that it's really highly genetic that the best predictor of if you're going to live over a hundred is do you have a relative who lived over a hundred? So is all this sort of lifestyle stuff um, likely to move the needle in terms of you know, radical life extension, or is it ultimately going to be some sort of genetic engineering or even, you know, kind of merging our bodies with machines to make mm -hmm. them more durable? Yeah. There's a quote I really like of if you, want to build a ship, don't organize the tasks and tell men what to do, teach them to yearn for the sea. Hmm. And, you know, don't die is very different than live forever. Don't die okay. is, is the most played game by every human on planet earth, every second of every day. Don't die is played more than capitalism. It's played more than any religion. It's played more than any other construct on this planet, more so than sex. So every few seconds we breathe, we look before we cross the street, we throw out moldy food. Humans don't want to die. Most, I mean, there are certain circumstances where you find people who are suicidal, but they're really the anomaly. Humans don't want to die. And the future is simply getting really, really good at not dying, just like we have been over the past few centuries. And so if you think about it in the terms of economics, there's the die economy, things that people do that increase the speed of aging and death, fast food, junk food, smoking, excessive alcohol consumption. Then there's the don't die economy, seatbelts, smoke detectors, clean water supply. So we're already playing don't die. This is not a novel concept and we're playing it with increasingly more amount of money. And what I'm suggesting is so to put this in the proper context, imagine we go back a million years and we hang out with Homo erectus and we say Homo erectus, where's food? The Homo erectus has an ax in their hand. We say, where's food, where's shelter, where's danger? We listen to those three answers. That person has information, we don't. And then we say, Homo erectus, tell us about the future of the species. And we laugh. We do not expect Homo erectus to tell us about anything about the modern world. That would be insane. Mm. And now in this moment, we are looking at intelligence in the form of AI that is very, 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 very soon going to be a million, if not a billion times smarter than we are. We're essentially Homo erectus in this situation. We can say absolutely nothing about the future. The mm -hmm. only thing I can say about the future is I don't want to die. I'm willing to play the game of what's going to come. Now, it may be terrible. It may be great. I don't know, but I want to be around for it. It could be the most spectacular existence in this part of the galaxy. And so whether, you know, whether the things I do are uh, actually extend life beyond some number, it really doesn't matter. The thing that matters is as a species, we are sober and wise enough to realize this moment we're in where we're going to probably experience the equivalent of a million years of evolution in a decade or two. Hmm. I well, one thing I'm curious about. So I was surfing this past weekend in a pretty rocky area. Um, you know, obviously it didn't get me right. Like I'm still kicking, but what is like accident um, risk? What is how how risk averse uh, must one be to be part of? Don't die, or how do you factor that in? Wouldn't it feel 
I don't know, like at a certain point, if I live for another 150 years, uh, yet I continue to surf at this rate uh, in the types of places that I would want to, at a certain point, like an accident is going to get me. Uh, is how how is how is that sort of looked at uh, via your frameworks? Yeah. Or not surfing in particular, but any yeah. sort of risky thing, the things that make life worth living, right? Like I, yeah. you know, do childbirth, uh, you know, I surf, I rock climb, like stuff like that, you know, like at some point, either childbirth or surfing or a subway brawl is going to get me, right? Yeah. I have a feeling you're not hopping on motorcycles uh, without a helmet. <laughs> or maybe at yeah. all, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it, um, we are in this weird in between state where, um, when death is inevitable, you can say, <clears throat> excuse me, you can come up with clever concepts like live fast, die young, mm -hmm. or you can say, I'm going to achieve immortality through my work, or I'm going to have children and they are going to be my immortality. I mean, humans have sought immortality for all time and eternity. I mean, that's religion is immortality. Work accomplishment is immortality. You know, children are immortality, like humans want immortality in any way they can get it. And so when you do that, you play certain games and those certain games carry certain risks. In a future where one can radically extend health span and lifespan, and we're not there yet, we're just at the beginning, it washes over every preconceived notion of what risk is. And so we're in this weird state where like, for example, I still drive a car to go to various mm -hmm. appointments and see doctors and do my things. That's going to be insane. <laughs> the risk that we take getting in, into a car is wild. Yeah. And so it's already a huge, um, I'm a big hypocrite in what I'm trying to do. Like the amount of effort I put towards not dying and the fact that I go get into my car and drive is crazy, but yeah. it's one of those things I can't really reconcile right now because I still need to go see doctors and do my thing. And so I don't have an ability to reconcile that right now. All I can acknowledge is the friction between where I think we're going to be at and where we're at now and the irrationality of me doing these things. How do you think about risk as it pertains to what you are doing? Because you are experimenting on yourself. You're the first person to do this. You're not the first person to take a bunch of vitamins and supplements, but that that is you know outside of the medical establishment and so we hasn't been heavily studied what happens when someone takes this many supplements every day yeah. how do you balance those sorts of risks because you're doing a little bit of renegade science here i mean you could frame this one of two ways one is you could say i'm actually more safe than everyone else because we do things based upon the scientific evidence and I'm the most measured person in history. So in that, in that regard, we have more guard safety guard wells set up than anyone else. If something bad is going to happen, we're going to catch it. And we're also doing all the good things that science has ever shown to be the case. Now on the flip side, you know, no one's ever done as much as I'm doing. And so you have some level of unknown. And so I think it is both. I am both the safest person in the world and also I'm taking some risk but it's definitely not clean cut that there's just one answer on this. It's nuanced. Do you like being measured? I do. Okay. So you're deriving some sort of additional value that like I wouldn't get. Uh, as yeah. somebody who dislikes being measured. I mean, I'm not like afraid of stepping on the scale like many women are, but like, you know, devoting a significant chunk of my day to having my blood drawn or yeah. having my bicep or my waist measured and stuff. Like just, just going through this entire system I think would be um, unpalatable to most people, but if you derive some sort of additional gain from it, you know, your behavior seems more rational, right? Yeah. I mean, my reward system is I am trying to impress the 25th century. Mm, gotcha. And so when I, when I try to find motivation on what I do on a daily basis, I specifically do not care what people in the early 21st century think of me. Hmm. It's noise. And so mm -hmm. in that regard, I view myself on a mission to do something that could change the course of intelligence in this part of the galaxy. Hmm. 
Let's look at some of the measurements that uh, you've taken of yourself. This is Brian Johnson's biological age measurement. And you've got a bunch of different categories here. NAD levels, you say, are of a 16-year-old. Uh, heart of a 37-year-old. Again, your biological age is 46, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, white blood cell count, 33. It goes on and on and on. Or there's one that's here where it's like a in, the inflammation of a 10-year-old. Is that what I'm saying? Wow. Um, so uh, Maybe 10-year-olds are really inflamed. You don't know, Zach. So this is your, your, comp <laughs> your comparing your... Um, uh, you're like looking at the averages, like this is what the average uh, 10 year olds inflammation levels would be and saying that, you know, Brian Johnson's are equivalent. I I'm reading that correctly. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we did. That's okay. a, that uh, specific graphic is, I think, two years old now. We were in the process of trying to educate people. What is the difference between a chronological age and biological age? And a lot of people don't know how to discern the difference that. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a 10 year old heart is different than an 80 year old heart. It looks different. It functions different. You're not going to mistake the two if you see them. And so what we're trying to say is we tease out these indicators that uh, the anatomical and functional elements of all the body's organs and biological processes, and you can age them. Some yeah. organs have good age markers, you know, good data. Other things are emergent but we try to put a number to everyone and it helps people build intuitions to understand that the body, uh, everyone experiences age differently and the organs do as well within the body. What, one of the most amusing measurements that you put out there the other day was this one. It was, mm -hmm. uh, you, you tweeted, uh, my nighttime erections are now better than the average 18 year old. Um, and this is, uh, you know, we've put up a lot of graphs on this show over, over the, years. And uh, this is just a special one. This is your your tumescence over time. I guess you have some sort of device that you're you're measuring um, your nighttime erections and showing that you've got the tumescence of uh, an 18 year old. Um, what's uh, I mean, first of all, congratulations. Thank um, you. <laughs> secondly, um, you know, what does uh, that result, how, how did you achieve that result? And um, what is it, you know, what does it mean to you to mm -hmm. have the uh, dick of an 18 year old? Thank you. Yeah, the boner is an 18 year old. Actually, it's, yeah. it's substantially better than an 18 year old. The the graph in there shows that it's like a 15 year old. So. Yeah. And from 20 to 29, which is the age bracket, average nighttime erection is 145 minutes. So my time was 179. So I crushed the 20 mm. to 29 age group. Yeah. Impressive. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this, like when, when we first started, we would take organs, uh, for example, like my heart and we would say, what is every possible way to measure the heart? And you can do blood, you can do ultrasound, you can do MRI, you can, you, know, you can do all these different measurements and then use that data to determine the age of the heart. You can do physical exercise, strength tests, you know, and so when it came to uh, sexual health, reproductive health, I posed the question to the team, what could we do so that I would have the most measured penis in human history? What do you do? Like, how do you measure a penis? That's just a uh, typical Monday in your uh, household. Is, uh, it's uh, dudes are really out, out here yeah. being like, how do I measure my penis? And <laughs> ever more met using ever more metrics than before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this so is we, like every, every man, regardless of their age is obsessed with measuring it. And you've just managed to like add a few additional dimensions to it. Right. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I mean, what, yes. <laughs> what's interesting about this is, you know, that, um, Obviously, it's culturally common for people to say it's a dick measuring contest. You know, that's mm -hmm. like, um, there's so much embedded in that statement. Uh, but, you know, sexual health is a really important function of being human. And mm -hmm. when a man cannot get an erection, then it's very problematic for all kinds of reasons. It affects their self-confidence, their psychological wellness. And so we basically did these baseline measurements where I did... I don't know, about a dozen different measurements on my penis and my sexual function. And those were the baseline. And then we said, okay, given that we have these baseline measurements, how would you go about doing that 
uh, how would you go about doing therapies that improve the penis health? And we did those, we did those therapies, including uh, shockwave therapy and Botox. And these are therapies. Wait, wait, wait! You you Botox shocked injected? you shocked and injected your penis with Botox. Botox. Correct. Your penis has gotten more Botox than my face ever will. Yeah. I think. <laughs> and and you saw you feel like you saw like what, did one of those work? Did they both work? Um, what was what were the outcomes? Yeah, they both they were additive in effect, and hmm. so yeah, it it took my my previous baseline measurements with nighttime erections. Uh, were uh, 132 minutes. So I went from 132 to 179. And this company that built this device, Atom Health in the UK, in all their data sets, they had never seen anyone uh, improve uh, erection, uh, both duration and strength as much as me. And so it was we exceeded all of the data examples. But I think what's interesting is like I had a lot of my friends message me. So I mean, right now, I, I'm basically erect for three hours a night to put that into context. And so a lot of my friends would privately message me and say, I don't think I'm ever erect. Like I think they're just gone. And mm. uh, what's interesting is a lack of sleep eliminates nighttime boners. Hmm. And that's a significant representation of one's psychological, cardiovascular and sexual health. It's a really bad thing. So I realized this topic is just endlessly ripe for people to riff on because it's hilarious. Yeah. It's also one of the most important things about being human. How would you, it, how it, would you do the same type of measurement for like ladies and who is doing that? Like, like how could one investigate this? Yeah. We've been talking to someone about this. So women apparently have arousal in sleep as well. Hmm. It's harder, it's harder to measure. Like it, it's yeah. women's uh, not as accessible as men. And so, yeah, we've been poking Let's around, trying to <laughs> trying to figure out how could we do this uh, for females. Yeah, but what's, yeah, what's that, the answer? Like, could, do you have any like clues? We don't. No, we just uh -huh. are looking into this. Apparently, it's just not well studied. Yeah, we have yet to shatter the glass ceiling of measuring our nighttime arousal. Yeah, yeah, yeah sadly. Let's, yeah. let's oh, wow. get on that. The, the, this is, I mean, one of the the fascinating thing to me about this is, um, it, it a it just shows you know, what you are willing to try, um, that you're, you're willing to try shock therapy or Botox, um, just to, to, to see it. I mean, you're not just flying blind, but a lot of mo most men I'll, I'll venture to say not be willing to tr even try that. And then secondly, yeah. just, you know, when you put this out on social media, you got a lot of people, you know, tweet uh quote tweeting it quote unquote dunking on it making fun of you but you don't seem to really care or like have or even you you seem to like revel in it in a way is that part of your personality that enables you to be this guy that uh puts himself out there you you, you just don't really care mm -hmm. what people say about you i mean not um it's not that i don't care i actually love it <laughs> Yeah, I got that sense. Yeah, I, it's my favorite. And so like I absolutely 100% I'm genuinely trying to make intelligence thrive in this part of the galaxy. There's nothing that is part of me that is doing this for attention, that is doing this to make money. Like I really am sober about this time and place that we are baby steps away from super intelligence. Mm -hmm. And it's going to I mean, take... people would be skeptical of the money aspect of that because you do have a product line, right? So you yeah. are, I, no, no, I have not, right? I have no problem with you making money. I think that's, that's great. If you have a product people want, but, um, people would, I just want to raise that. So people aren't like, well, he's just doing this completely altruistically. Yeah. I mean, like, and the thing is, again, I could care less when anyone says whether they're skeptical of me, like it genuinely doesn't matter. I mean, I, when I did blueprint, I made it free for the entire world on day one. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. remained free for the entire world on day one. And then it went viral and everyone said, make this accessible. It's way too hard. So I made it accessible. And then people are like, you're such a dick. Why'd you make it accessible and selling it? So like, there's, there's just, there's right. no way you're going to ever yeah. going to win with, with uh, homo sapiens. Like they're going to criticize you for everything you do all the time, no matter what. So the only way to live within it is love it. And so, well, 
Yeah. You, you know, Liz, Liz seems interested in it. So I, I want to play this, this meal. I'm too like Catholic your... for this. I'm very at peace. I'm like, I'm very memento mori about everything. But I, we, I'm we have this... frankly looking forward to old age. I think it's going to be awesome. We have this video of one of your day, your, your daily staples. I, I take it. Um, this is from <laughs> Brian has a very entertaining YouTube channel. Uh, anyone listening to this can, you know, check those out. He's, he's very uh, good at, you know, put it, putting his ideas uh, in a presentable form on, on YouTube. And I took a clip from one of his meal plans uh, because uh, Liz and I were looking at this earlier and I, I want to play that so that people get a sense of, you know, this is how you structure, uh, you know, every, every aspect of your life is structured, including of course your meals. So uh, let's play that to see like, what does it take to start living this kind of lifestyle? To start, weigh and chop your raw vegetables. First, take cauliflower for anti-inflammatory and fiber. Do the same with your broccoli. Broccoli is for antioxidants, bowel health, and fiber. Measure out 50 grams of either shiitake or maitake mushrooms for immune system health, one peeled clove of garlic for heart and immune health, and three grams of ginger for a variety of benefits including liver, pancreas, artery health, and digestion. Boil the broccoli, cauliflower, and mushrooms together for seven to nine minutes until fairly soft. The base of your super veggie will be 150 grams of cooked black lentils for protein and fiber. Add one tablespoon of cumin for inflammation, liver, and pancreas health. One tablespoon of hemp seeds for healthy omega-6 and 3. Add the chopped ginger and garlic you put aside earlier. Add one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar for blood sugar and taste. I also add one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil to every meal I eat for its incredible whole body benefits. You've now completed Super Veggie. Good job! Eating this can take me up to 34 minutes. I know, I've timed it. So sometimes I do a blended version. It's just as delicious and takes less time to eat. I, I love that. Uh, I love the, um, like how many minutes did you shave off that? But do you shave off that by the way, when you blend it and eat it? 21. Wait, so you shave off 21 minutes. So you eat it in 13 minutes. Yeah. I said, that's a huge time saver. Liz, Why? are you ready? Are you on board yeah, with this? Like, no, I mean, this looks disgusting, frankly. Like, how is oh, it? Like, is this, it's, it's is, it, is it good? For flavor though. Is, is it good? And like, like, you know, is, are you just the type of person where the trade-offs like to me eating, you know, the vast majority of meals like that sounds unappealing to the point where I probably would stop looking forward to tomorrow, mm. but you seem to be, you know, is there, is there a personality difference where like, I'm a hedonist in pursuit of different things, playing a different game, but you find, you know, eating the, uh, maitake mushroom cauliflower broccoli combo to be much less, uh, awful than I would find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a highly predictable observation. And I'd say when I see people go through this process, they eat it and their initial reaction is, huh, not that bad. Actually, mm -hmm. it's kind of good. And then day two, I feel amazing. And then day seven comes around and they say, I can't imagine going back to what I was eating before. And mm -hmm. I'd say 95% of people I uh, interact with go through this identical process. They initially consider it to be unfathomable that they would actually enjoy vegetables. I feel like, well, I mean, I love vegetables. I cook a ton. Um, but I almost think that maybe I, uh, in the grand scheme of things, fall more into like the Tim Ferriss territory where like he's very cute and, you know, measures um, so many different components of what he's eating and tries to make sure that there's, you know, ample protein and has a whole supplement routine and all of these things. But then there's like very cute little uh, exceptions for the four hour body where it's like, you can have like a dry red wine, maybe like two glasses of like a Malbec or whatever. And it's a little bit like, I don't know if there's actually as much scientific backing behind this as Ferris perhaps wants people to believe. It's more that like, he really likes Malbec and it's hard for him to sort of stay on that type of thing. Like, what do you make of, do you find that more people can be successful with that type of approach or is this approach really like, does it just take, um, you know, a deeper understanding of the trade-offs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the difference is that no human has seriously attempted to defy death. Yeah. That's my objective. 
mm-hmm. yeah. is for the 25th century to say in the early 21st century, there was a legitimate scientific approach to not only defy death, but prepare all of intelligence for super intelligence. So I'm not trying to influence and make friends. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not trying to, I'm trying to change the trajectory of the species. And the thing that I've tried to do is be true to the scientific evidence. And this is so, I mean, to put this in, go ahead. Oh, well, the thing that I'm just curious about is like, aren't people so, you know, in in some ways people are rational actors, you know, acting in their own self-interest, but in other ways, we're these pleasure seeking animals who love to self-sabotage. And so, you know, how does this play out where like, perhaps we, you know, per your research and experimentation do stumble upon a pretty solid formula for how to really, really extend your lifespan and health span. But we're still these like, you know, McDonald's cravings, craving creatures at the end of the day, always pursuing sex and cigarettes. I'm like, like, how do you look at that? The compliance thing? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to make the observation that when there were 13 colonies, they were torn between continuing under the, under the monarch mm-hmm. and going down the path of this new weird idea of democracy. And Thomas Paine kind of put things over the edge with his common sense pamphlet. 500,000 copies were sold. Mm-hmm. We end up doing the democracy thing. And democracy ended up being a better system of intelligence management for a large collection of people. The monarch was actually pretty inefficient and pretty poor at creating uh, wealth. Yeah. And what I'm proposing in, in the same way that my mind is a monarch and my body is the democracy. And so what I did is I said, I'm going to ask my organs what they need to be their best selves. And so I measured every single one and said, how are you doing? Mm-hmm. We looked at the scientific evidence. And so this is the algorithm. The algorithm works in conjunction with my body's biological processes and determines what I eat when I go to bed. And what I'm proposing, this transition's inevitable. We, we are, it doesn't matter what humans say about this. This is happening as we speak right in front of our eyes. Algorithms are doing things better than we can in every regard. Yes, we are pleasure seeking self-sabotage animals, but that's only because we don't have the tools and technology to get ourselves out of that. You take one example where that's solved, like Ozembic, and humans consume more of it than the manufacturer can produce it. Now, even mm-hmm. with the side effects of Ozembic, Ozembic is an algorithm that turns off your hunger receptors. Are humans willing to adapt technology to modify their pleasure-seeking, sabotaging self? Yes. How fast? It's ferocious. And so what I'm trying to show is an algorithm that does this towards the, the goal of tomorrow. But our time horizon for Ozempic adoption is admittedly small, right? Uh, in what regard? Well, we've only just started to, you know, see people like, like we have no idea whether the demand will majorly slow, whether the side effects, um, you know, as they present themselves will end up, you know, lessening demand. We just kind of, we're still in the first, what, two or three years of this really being adopted. And so I'm curious about what it'll look like 15 years oh, from sure. now. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not even, uh, suggesting that Zemex is a good idea. Yeah. I'll- I'm not, I'm not even suggesting that it's worth it. I mean, I think the side, mm-hmm. of, the side effect profile is interesting, but what I'm saying is um, I'm, I'm making the observation, we humans love to shit on new ideas that challenge our understanding of reality or challenge our preferences for our own vices. Mm-hmm. And the moment yeah. we get a chance to relieve ourselves from that burden, we run away with it. And so what I'm, suge- what I'm suggesting to you is it doesn't matter what, any of us say about reality, our preferences, our wants, or our needs. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's all a smokescreen. It's what's, interesting. What's the future? Well, I was, I just want to stay on this for one second. What's the future of sex in that same vein? Like if you say the future of eating is not the Liz path, but the Brian path, what is the future of sex in, you know, the 25th century? How will people find that pleasure for themselves? Yeah. The, if you truly sit into this thought experiment and you genuinely contemplate whether we are in fact homo erectus and it could entirely be the case the only rational response is to say i don't know that if 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 the the intelligence disparity between us and an insect 
is some orders of magnitude. And the intelligence difference between us and AI is an equally, if not greater level of you know, orders of magnitude. Mm-hmm. How would we dare say anything about the future? And this is why I come back to don't die every single time. For the first time in human history, the only thing we can utter, which makes any sense whatsoever, is we don't want to die. We don't know if we want happiness. We don't know if we want sadness. We don't know if we want depression. We don't know if we want hunger. We don't know anything because we're, we're going into this, this new phase of existence where we have the controls over reality. So mm-hmm. sex is a biochemical state. Like uh, just remove for a moment the physical act. It is a biochemical state of stimulation. We can mm-hmm. absolutely program that, no questions asked. So what is the future of arousal, you know, and, and will we want arousal? Like how big, to me, the thing that's interesting is if, if we, if you go back a few hundred years and you say, how big is reality? You'd say, well, I can use my five senses and kind of fill out existence. I can smell certain things. I can understand the texture of certain things when I feel, but you'd have an answer. And then you fast forward a couple hundred years and you figure out the electromagnetic spectrum we experience a trillionth of the actual uh, electromagnetic spectrum of reality. There's a microscopic world beyond the res- resolution of our eyes, which is near infinite. The galaxy is, is almost so big, we can't even understand it. And so if you say, what is the conscious, what is the state of consciousness? Like how big could consciousness be? What could we actually experience? Now, right now we have feelings like happiness and sadness. We know what it's like to fall in love and to break up be in pain. We know what it's like to skin our knee. We have a certain set of, of experiences of what it actually feels like to be human, but we have no clue if the future of conscious existence is going to be the same difference in order of magnitude as we've experienced in physical reality. Why not? And this wow. is again, like why in this moment, uh, it's a invitation for soberness and humility we've never had before. I, I appreciate that call for just extreme epistemic humility. And what yeah. you're seem to be saying is that the one thing that is consistent to get, uh, across all biological creatures is the drive to not die. Uh, and um, that uh, to keep, you know, propagating the genes and um, that maybe that's that's the drive to, to follow uh, in, in this, uh, I don't know, in, interregnum we're in right now. The, and I, I mean, it, it struck me when you were saying like, okay, my brain is the monarch and now it's listening to my organs. Uh, and this is like the democracy of the body. It's like that this was, you're, you're reversing the, in, you know, historically there was, there was this group called the physiocrats who took the function of functions of the body and then tried to extend that as a metaphor yeah. to look at the ideal political system. And now you're folding the, po- the politics back into the body, which is pretty fascinating. What would it, uh, well, what would it look like um, if our society, our culture started taking that idea seriously, mm-hmm. um, what would, how would politics, government, yeah. society look different um, from it, yeah. it, if that change would happen? I mean, if what I'm basically playing for is AI progress is going to create existential crisis in society. It's going to do simple things like it's going to take our jobs. We're not going to know what identity means anymore to have a profession, or we're going to whipsawed so much. It's going to be very hard to retrain ourselves at that speed. It's going to do things like potentially be better at governance. It's going to potentially be thing, do things better, like telling the truth. It's going to be better at, you know, and the list goes on and on. When that happens, we're going to face these really imminent practical questions. Who do we trust for governance? Who do we trust as a politician? Who do we trust to tell us the correct answer? What do I do for a job? How does economics work? Who pays taxes? So all these basic questions that we've we've solved in our society, like we've really have a functional society with a lot of basic questions answered about our existence. They're all going to be called into question. And in that moment of existential crisis, we will have these basic questions to play. Then what, what do we do? What's our game? 
Do we all buckle down on religion that we just think the afterlife is a game that's to play for? Do we say capitalism is the answer? Let's keep on trying to make money at any cost. Do we, like, what do we do? And what I'm suggesting is there is no philosophical, political, practical, economic model that slides in there that adapts for the existential threats we have as a species and the potential where we have, uh, that we have with super intelligence. I'm trying to build the guiding ideology for the 21st century that transitions us from homo sapiens to whatever comes next and don't die. It's not, it's not just about me individually. Don't die is practically relevant to don't die individually. Don't kill each other. Don't kill the planet and align AI with don't die. Hmm. You have this practical question, like you build super intelligence and then what do you do with it? Do you become better at war? Do you conquer more territory? Do you make more money in the stock market? Do you get more social media followers? Like, what do you do with this new superpower? And if you walk AI into the old games that Homo sapiens have played for two hundred thousand years, we're probably going to annihilate ourselves, and not too not too long. And what I'm suggesting is, go ahead. No, no, no. Please finish. What I'm suggesting is, in any other time of existence, we'd say, well, we're all going to die anyway, so what does it matter? And that so easily justifies a martyrdom kind of mentality. And what I'm calling into question is that may not be true for the first time in history. And if that's not true, every single observation we have about reality right now is probably dead. It's probably on its way out. Oh, man. It's, what you're saying is that a lot of what uh, the the beliefs or systems we have are like a giant cope for the fact that we don't know what to do about the fact that we all die. Um, and uh, I just wonder, like, you know, I know a little bit of your biography. We're not going to go deep into that. I know that you used to be religious. Um, you're, you know, used to Mormon, have relationship. Right? Yeah, you're Mormon, used to have relationships. But is it like, you know, leaving all that behind, uh, to pursue this and think in like 25th century terms, is that lonely, like for you personally? Um, mm -hmm. Or is there something again about your personality where you, you don't really mind because it's going to be hard to get, you know, someone else to go on this journey with you because it's, it's so extreme. Yeah. My, I always found myself bored in school. I hated the speed of learning and how they structured knowledge in this uh, rigid way. And I had to regurgitate it. I would just go home and read biographies and I've read a lot of them. And so when I am, a, am I, when I'm trying to dialogue with myself or others and trying to solve problems, I'll spin up these historical figures and talk to them. Hmm. People who in their time and place were able to identify an impossibly hard problem. The world hated them. And then their ideas prevailed inevitably. And that's who I primarily converse with in my own mind. And, and then I also, you know, spin up these, these thought experiments with the 25th century. But, but for me, the game I personally am playing is trying to muster the most coherent thought possible of a human that exists in the early 21st century, trying to eliminate all the noise and see right through it. And this is why sleep matters. This is why nutrition matters. When you don't sleep, you're cloudy. You're, you're minimized to your basic necessities of existence. And I really am trying to optimize for clarity of mind. Like what can we see? Can, can we see this moment for what it is and be wise enough to act accordingly? Hmm. Are you worried about, on one hand, you just, you know, advised epistemic humility, which I think makes a lot of sense. But then also to some degree, reading between the lines, you are comparing yourself to the great men of history, which is possibly one of the least humble possible comparisons. Do you feel attention there? I mean, what, um, why would I respect the concept of humility? Why would that, why is that any game I would care to play? Who created the idea of humility? Why is it beneficial? Why would I even care to play that game? Well, no, I was, but you had just, counseled sort of epistemic humility, you know, 10 minutes ago. Sure. The, the humility is in, um, 
is knowing in what you don't know. Exactly. It's right. not in the bravery or the courage to try to strike at something that supersedes a person's time and place. And this is the thing I admire. I, I, I do. I, I openly, uh, I openly share, I care about the 25th century's respect, which means I view myself as someone who could, who could potentially be remembered by the 25th century. Now, if people want to try to criticize me and say, I'm an egomaniac or that's fine. They're using, they're using frameworks that people understand in the early 21st century. I don't respect those. Hmm. If it's something that we consider to be, uh, yeah, something, a, a, something that people use to diminish the social standing of somebody, I could care less. And Which so, yeah, frameworks of the 21st century do you value, if, if any? Or if a, morals uh, or principles? Like, do you have any morals or principles that sort of ground you that are 21st century morals? Yeah, I, I really genuinely am entirely open to a rewrite of my absolute existence. Hmm. I really am genuinely. And I, I, again, I'm, I'm stuck in between. I still do irrational things like drive my car. Mm -hmm. um, so I fully recognize that I am a ridiculous person. I am hypocritical. I am irrational. I have blind spots. Um, I also realize I'm probably going to die in the most ironic way possible. I'm probably going to get hit by a bus. I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to choke on a pill. Like I, it's probably unquestionable that I'm going to die with irony. So I'm, I'm fully aware of all those things yet, despite those things, I'm genuinely trying to do my best mm -hmm. to just like the people I admire of old who were able to punch through in their time and place. They're the people, they're my heroes. That's who I really care mm -hmm. to be like. Hmm. The, the the reason i mean it's we're in an age now where a lot of our institutions seem to be failing us and that may be one reason why mm -hmm. outsiders self-experimenters are becoming more relevant first of all you have a, a medium to directly reach people without any intermediaries um which is interesting and you you, you're transparent in, in, in publishing the data, but yeah, YouTube um, is wildly really successful. Like it's very cool that there's this very, um, yeah. you know, democratizing platform that allows you, you know, hopefully without any sort of censorship, though sometimes the YouTube censors rain down their terror on us all, uh, but allows you to transmit these things directly to an audience without any need for yeah. any, for sure. you know, gatekeeping really but the, like the gatekeeping um you know as someone who has followed biotech policy for a while i always cringe at this chart this is known as uh e-rooms law which is the yeah. inverse of moore's law which moore's law is kind of the increasing um computing power at with falling cost this is the new drugs per billion in r d spent and you yeah. see like as fda tightens tightens regulations it, yeah. it's a kind of downward trajectory that has kind of gone flat in recent years because of uh the uh existence of targeted or orphan drugs um you know i wonder like what how do you view the role of self-experimentation in like breaking this sort of stagnation like the one example that i want to pull up that might be relevant is this dr barry marshall won a nobel prize for discovering that ulcers were yeah. caused by bacterial infection um not stress or whatever the other conventional explanations were yeah. at the time and the way he discovered it was by infecting himself with the bacteria so there is clearly a role for self experimentation the problem seems to be finding a, a proper control because you know you're you're kind of like throwing everything in the kitchen sink at it. Mm -hmm. I know it's not it's not that haphazard, but it can be when you're not in the, the clinical trial setting, it can be difficult to pick apart exactly what is working and what's not working. So what realms in what realms is self-experimentation mm -hmm. useful and when is it not so useful? Yeah, I mean, if you think about pre-COVID, imagining that the world would shut down within weeks, 
and the world would redesign itself entirely around a given phenomena was almost unthinkable to all of us. Hmm. Yet it happened. And it was stunning. And now you, you take a situation where AI is progressing, it's doing things. I think the effect is going to be that, if not greater. And so these questions, you know, like uh, under what circumstances do we do what things? Now, before the mRNA vaccine was widely done, you know, with COVID, they had a, you know, a few decades of, of research. I think the first time they did it was like 1987 or something like that. It's quite a while. But then all of a sudden you had mass adoption of a gene therapy in like months. And so we humans are terrible at planning to prevent crisis. We're pretty good at responding to crisis, not in terms of our efficacy, like, like we really you know, mess it up, but we certainly step it up. We're a pretty um, tenacious species. And what I'm yeah, arguing uh, here, go ahead. No. Well, I mean, I, so what, what, one thing I'm, I'm trying to get at here is your, your process, like the, the actual scientific process for how you yeah. decide something works or doesn't work. Um, and I've got it. I've, I've actually pulled another video clip that we can show. I think that will help uh, put a finer point on this. It is uh, when you decided that you, your son and your father would share plasma with each other because mm -hmm. the theory was that, um, you know, plasma uh, dr transfusions would help with de-aging if you get it from a younger person. Um, and it, it's a it's a very touching clip and it's uh, in its own way, it has some emotional resonance. So let's roll that for a minute and then I'll um, ask you a question uh, about this. You ever done a uh, multi-generational exchange? Never. Whoa. One, one liter out, one liter in for me, one liter out for me, liter into dad. So I mean, you guess it's, yeah, with Talmadge, you know, we, he's been on Blueprint for two years now with me and we do all of our blood work together. And you're right, like the, if you look at the results of our blood work, we're almost indistinguishable. I can be a part of a Blueprint therapy that would help reverse my age and my dad's age and my grandpa's age all at the same time. And so I was ecstatic to have that opportunity to be a part of that. Look, um, before I ask the process question there, um, I mean, that must have felt good to hear your son saying that he wants to be part of what you're doing. Yeah, the, the genesis of that was my, I was talking to my father one day and he was freaking out because he's in the legal profession and he had just written something in a brief he walked away from his work and came back and saw that it was a jumbled mess. And he freaked out because he was experiencing some kind of cognitive lapse and he was unaware of it. He was in the process of losing his mind. And it was mm. terrifying to him because he had this idea that if he started losing his mind, he would notice it, but it had happened without his awareness. And he called me in a panic and I said, dad, you know, we've been looking at these plasma exchanges that have been used in studies for Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's. If you're interested, I'd be happy to give you a liter of my plasma. And my son overheard that conversation. He said, I'm in with the whole family. Let's go. And so it was like nice. this playful response, but it was in response to my father, and, you know, and like, I, I've, I'm on a mission to keep him alive. And, you know, it's, he, he explains in great detail to me, the ravages of aging. You know, like very basic things. Like if he's going down stairs, he's not going to have things in his hand because if he's concentrating on holding things in his hand, he's got to watch step by step as he walks. And like the list is so long of the awfulness of aging. It's just an absolutely brutal situation. Yeah. And you know, like there's just like nothing charming about it uh, as he does this. And so I'm, I've been trying to help him with the best I can, but yeah, I mean, our process to answer your question is, yeah. We rank the science according to power rankings. So that's mm -hmm. primarily what Blueprint is, is the nutrition and the exercise and the sleep are all according to the best science in existence. Mm. And then we go outside and we explore on the frontier and we say these therapies, the evidence is not quite there yet. They're not power laws, but they're interesting and we can do it. So we will do it. Now, in and the, the blood of, transfusion fell into that category, yeah? Exactly. Okay. And you know, there's a few million done in the U.S. every year. They're safe. 
you know, they're done all the time. It's just a routine procedure. So we felt like the safety protocol was very easily. Yes. The only question was, would it have an efficacious outcome? So we really do play very safe with the therapies. We're not doing wild things that are not tested and not known. We're very, very good at safety and evidence-based approaches. And the reason I brought that up is because in this case, you concluded it wasn't worth it, right? The, the you don't do the blood transfusions anymore. Uh, me personally, but only because my biomarkers are already pretty competitive with an 18 year old. Uh, Whereas with my father, his, his, the results in him were dramatic. It slowed oh, his really? speed of aging by the equivalent of 25 years. So he was aging at the speed of a 71 year old, which is his chronological age. After one therapy, it was 46 years of age and that's maintained for six months. And so the effect size was pretty mm -hmm. similar to what you see in the animal models. And so we were pretty stunned at how efficacious it was. Now, like there's a lot of questions. Was it because he received one liter of my plasma or because he donated a liter of his plasma? We don't know. Mm -hmm. So there's more questions, but still, I mean, it, it changed his life. His coworkers were like, what the hell? This does wow. not make any sense. Uh, his performance is so dramatic. So yeah, so for my this dad's is a case, defense. Yeah. This is a defense of blood boys. Then we always hear about the Silicon Valley uh, blood boys, where you, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, it was it was famously satirized in uh, the show Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> you're kind of making the case that that's a that's a good idea. Everyone should have their own blood. The boy. thing that's the hardest to picture is a whole bunch of like American boomers embracing the blood boys, right? <laughs> Like if there's one thing I know to be sure, it's that boomers are like the exact, you know, stereotypically and, and notoriously the exact opposite of what you're describing, right? Like extremely stubborn people. I don't think get into uh, that 25th century mindset. Liz. Yeah, no, but legitimately, yeah, so the I, 60s. come on. No, but I do want to ask, I mean, you know, your larger project aside, it does, you know, what you're talking about with watching your dad age. I mean, I have some, some old people, um, you know, I'm in a caretaking role toward right now mm -hmm. in my family. And that's mm -hmm. definitely something that's so, you know, constantly present on my mind, this mm -hmm. idea of where did we go astray? Where did we, where did we go yeah. wrong with our, with our, with our approach societally to old age? Because from the old people that I see around me, I see, um, huge issues with bone density, huge yeah. issues with extreme loss of muscle mass, really failing to anticipate, um, you know, the type of muscle mass that one would need mm -hmm. earlier in age in order to continue to have, you know, the ability to live an active life in, you know, their seventies and eighties. Um, you know, you see so many issues with osteoporosis, you see, you know, old people not really eating enough protein, uh, and all of these issues, then you have, you know, poor sleep quality, they really compound. And it seems like we're in kind of a crisis of aging where we're now able to extend yeah. lifespans by an awful lot by basically, you know, relegating people to endless hospital appointments and doctor's appointments in their 70s and 80s, but we're really not improving their health span. What are ways that you see this realistically changing? Yeah, that's what Blueprint is. So back to your question, Liz, you know, does this mill belong with, you know, a couple glasses of wine? And mm -hmm. does it, I'm trying to make the case that we are in a different era. Like you do those things when death is inevitable, mm -hmm. when we're on the cusp of not knowing how long and how well we can live, it's a different game. And it's a different game of the body running the show, not the monarch mind, which is the, the self-sabotaging you know, entity. So yeah, I, I mean, there, there's an unlimited number of people in the world who are going to write recipe books and talk about this health and wellness. I'm the only one in the world saying don't die. And so my protocol is very different. My approach is very different, but I'm trying to say this is next level for all of us. But I agree with you, like seeing my dad, it's unbearable. Uh, it's just, uh, it's so frightening. And to my father's credit, he rages against death. Hmm. He wants to be conscious so badly and he's such a bright light. And I see this, you know, when in people around him, they just kind of give up and I understand. Like it's a daunting situation and what are you going to do? You know, eat more vegetables. And that's going to change your outcome. Like you really need to get out in front of this a long time ahead of that. So I'm with you. It's really problematic. It's right in front of our face. And it may be the case that we don't need to feel hopeless anymore. Hmm. Let me ask you to wrap this up. Um, we've laid out the basics of what it is you do. You told us about your day. Um, it might be daunting to a lot of people to consider changing their lifestyles this dramatically. But, um, you know, if it sparked anyone's interest, 
what would what do you recommend as just a starting point for someone you yeah. know that that you've learned uh, is a good starting point for someone who wants to improve their health and their health span? Yeah, I say hi, friend. It's nice to see you, and please do not feel intimidated by any of this because what I do, you don't need to do. There's a few simple power laws that will get you the majority of the benefits that I get, and they're easy. So one is don't smoke. Two, get six hours of week, uh, six hours of exercise per week. If you're at zero, even one is great. Just get some exercise. Three, eat a blueprint and or Mediterranean-like diet. Four, have a BMI between 18.5 and 22.5. Five, watch the alcohol consumption. I do zero, which is the best. And then uh, finally, you know, I get good sleep. Now, if you can do those basic things, you get the majority of the benefits of the routine. And then the last one, I guess I'll say, which is the kicker, which is really try to identify your worst vice. For me, it was evening Brian who would eat uncontrollably to solve the pain of the day. And the vices are oftentimes the hardest things mm. to kick. They're also uh, causing the most damage potentially. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you don't worry about, you don't need blood transfusions. You don't need to take a whole bunch of pills every day. You don't need to do all my, all the stuff I'm doing. You can absolutely uh, be in a great position just by doing the basics. Does evening Brian ever come back or any version of that, that, you know, that we all have, you know, the devil on the shoulder yeah. who is telling us, you know, take that, take that extra drink, smoke it. Um, do, do you still have that, that battle, that demon, or have you completely crushed him with your, you know, yeah. super strong grip strength? <laughs> like all things, it's both. So one yeah. is I've mastered him where now when I size up a potential vice, I feel more pain than I do pleasure. Like it's <laughs> absolutely not worth it to me. It just sounds awful. It's going to ruin my sleep. I'm going to feel grumpy the next day. I'm going to hate life. No way. At the same time, I don't have anything in my house uh, that I could, you know, binge on because I do not trust myself at all. Hmm. Nice. Well, we'll, we'll, Liz and I will both work on that. I'll cut down on the drinking. Liz is gonna stop smoking, right? And I don't. We'll, uh, I don't smoke very frequently, Zach. Yeah. Don't, okay. Well, don't wrap we'll me work, out to our audience. We'll, we'll we'll work our way up to the veggie blend. I think I could do the thirty-four minute version, but I don't think I'm gonna do the blended uh twenty uh, uh eleven minute version yet. <laughs> Brian Johnson, thank you very much thank for so joining much, us Brian. today. This was a, a great conversation, um, and thank you all who tuned in. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.